mechanical level ranging from compound efficacy to toxicity. He, is, he received his PhD from the University of Cambridge as a Cambridge AIDS scholar in 2005 and worked in the lead discovery informatics group at Mawaidis in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as well as at Leiden University in the Netherlands before his current post. Andrea's work is documented in more than 100 scientific publications in the chemoinformatics, bioinformatics, and drug discovery fields. And he holds positions on the editorial boards of multiple journal, journals such as Combinatorial Chemistry and High Chemistry the General of Chemical Information and Modeling and Expert Opinion on Drug Discovery. Among others, Andrea has received the EFMGN Medicinal Chemist in Academy of Science in 2010, as well as the Medicinal Chemistry Innovation Prize of the German Chemical and Pharmaceutical Societies. And the Bayer Early Excellence in Science Award in 2011. In 2012, he received the LRI Innovative Science Award of the European Chemical Industry Council. And in 2013, he was awarded an ERC starting grant to model the mixture effects of chemical structures and biological systems using mechanistic approaches. Dr. Bender talks on using bioactivity in the array and computer logic to support market deconversion and compound design. It's all to Dr. Ideal Bender. <coughs> Great. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Rangapo, for your introduction. And it's my pleasure to be here in my show. It's very really much switching off the light, actually. But, okay. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, it's actually um, our uh, relationship actually goes back a while. Uh, to give you the background, uh, Dr. Basafa actually uh, contacted me a year and a half ago. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, so he was a Pravata visiting fellow in Cambridge. So he spent a few months in my life. And I think it's a very fruitful relationship now. So we do chem informatics work in my group. Uh, we analyze data. I will go through that. And Dr. Bazaka's lab, together with many collaborators, Professor Rangapa, for example, as well, does experiments. And that's very fruitful. You develop a hypothesis based on data using computational tools. Then you do an experiment. You de de develop the next better hypothesis. Yeah, That's the circle. And that's the way science should work. So thanks a lot for contacting me. I think that's a very fruitful relationship. OK, that's just the introduction. Uh, so what we will talk about now is about analyzing data. Uh, and there's a good reason to analyze data and to use computers. And the main reason is, there's a lot of data, and it's not always easy to analyze. Sometimes you have contradictions in data, for example, and it's not always an easy task, but it's important because you make better decisions if you take all the data you have into account. Maybe that's not what you want to do in your personal life, that would be boring, but in science, you need to take all the data you have into account to make the best possible decision, to design the best possible experiment. It's very important in science. Okay, so what is the situation today? Uh, the situation today is we have A, a lot of data, but that's relatively easy to handle. Even if you have NGS data, if you have imaging data, you have terabytes of data, but still, you can buy a hard disk. Computers today, they are powerful, so it's relatively OK. But the bigger problem is the data we have is very heterogeneous. You don't have uh, uh, standardized uh, identifiers, which makes it difficult to search data properly in databases. Um, you have very different types of data. You have, for example, chemical structures. You have sequence data. You have three-dimensional data. You have gene expression data. You have different formats. Yeah, and that's the much bigger problem. The data is very heterogeneous. Yeah? And that makes it difficult to analyze data using computers and to integrate it properly. That's the much bigger problem, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and to improve that situation at least a little bit, um, that's what we are trying to do in my group uh, in Cambridge. We're trying to integrate data, yeah? so to standardize data so that we can analyze them in order to make the best possible decision, yeah? to pick the best molecule, yeah? or to say that's the protein target we should test. Okay. So you make the best decision given all the data that you have. That's the point of all work. And so which data do we usually look at? It's usually three types of data, and they are very different in nature. Uh, the first one is molecular structure. So I'm a chemist. Uh, my heart is still in chemistry. Although I acknowledge other disciplines are equally important, you need to uh, be able to communicate with people from other disciplines and also understand as much biology, in my case, as possible. But still, chemistry is still uh, what I'm very happy with. 
uh, and modular structures, there's many of them, the databases you have 25 million structures maybe, you can buy 12 million compounds approximately, so that gives you quite a lot of power. That's the independent variable. We can store structures as well, relatively well in computers. Of course, you have different protonation states, you have different serochemistry, or it's unknown. Um, but still, with the, with the uh, chemistry part, you're relatively happy with it. It's relatively soft, relatively. And um, however, if you go to the other type of data we deal with, uh, things become more problematic. If you go to the protein uh, site, for example, a model action site, in this case, we quite often know the sequence of our targets. That's quite often the case. But in many cases, we don't know 3D structures, as we have before in the talk of uh, Professor Blundell, for example. And what's also very important is we don't know much about the dynamics of our biological system. Okay, what's the interplay between different protein targets? There are many unknowns in there. So if we go to this corner uh, of the triangle, and the information is very important, but there are many gaps in our knowledge. Uh, and finally, if we go to the phenotype, uh, what is apparent here is that phenotype definitions are very specific. Um, so if you have, for example, a toxicity model, that toxicity model, you have uh, isolated cells, you have uh, organ slices, and you have full organs. There are cases, many cases, where contradictory answers from the different systems, which are meant to tell you the same thing, yeah? but they give you contradictory answers. So the phenotype definitions, they are very specific to the different systems we look at. And that's a problem, because if you want to analyze data, we need many data points to learn something from that. Yeah? Uh, but if our phenotype definitions are very essay or very situation specific, uh, that is problematic, because then we test 10 compounds in a particular system, 10 compounds in another system, and so on. We cannot pull this data. Yeah? So we cannot have a large scale analysis of all the data available. Okay? So this corner here is possibly the most difficult one of all. But of course, it's not only about those three data types. There's also information that connects those corners. And what we have here, along the link between molecular structure and the protein, is large bioactivity databases. I will go through that in a few minutes. And we have millions of data points that tell us this compound binds to this target, or as an inhibitor of a particular enzyme, or an agonist of a receptor, and so on. So we have quite a lot of information along this line. If we go from proteins to phenotypes, that's what many people uh, what would call pathways information. Uh, but if you think about the term pathways, that's something that humans made up. Okay, if you have a biological system, the system does not think in terms of pathways. We need pathways to understand biology. Okay, it's much more complex because interactions change depending on the particular state of the biological <coughs> system. Uh, but still, what we have here are databases that are contain information such as pathways. Um, and what we have along this uh, axis here, that's experimental data. So we have a particular cell line, we test compounds for cytotoxicity, and that's the phenotype we read out. Or we have drug side effect data. Or we have different systems uh, where we have a compound, and we have the response of the biological system that gives us a phenotype. Okay? So we have data along those, edge, uh, along those uh, corners, but also along the edges. And that's what we're trying to integrate. The advantage is, quite often, in many cases, we have information about who of the data types, and we can infer the third. Okay? So we have a chemical structure, a phenotype, and the computer can develop a hypothesis about the protein type. Or we have a phenotype, we know which pathways or protein targets might be involved, and the computer tells us that's the right type of chemistry to choose. Okay? And that's then the best decision we can make based on all the data that we have. <coughs> and, and this is the point uh, of what we're trying to do. It's really one of those three questions we're trying to ask. First one is, what's the reason for an effect? That's the question for the mode of action. And that becomes more and more important because, for example, uh, pharma companies, they're moving towards phenotypic screening, which means you have a cell system, you have some imaging readout, but you don't know the target. Right? But still, you would like to identify the target to crystallize your protein, for example, to optimize the compound, to anticipate side effects. There's many good reasons to know the target. Yeah? And this is where uh, our computational algorithms can help. Second question is, which compound should I test? Yeah? And there's 12 million compounds or 50 million compounds we can buy. We can synthesize many more. And the size of chemical space was mentioned before. And many people estimate this in the order of 10 to the 60 to 10 to the 80. Yeah? That's more uh, than the uh, number of uh, proton masses in the universe. Yeah? So there's no way we can synthesize all those molecules. Um, and that's the question here, uh, which chemistry should we test? Um, and the third question is usually uh, the question from phenotype. So if I have a particular uh, patient, does that patient respond better to drug E or drug F? So which chemistry should I pick to change my phenotype from disease to 
you know, these are the questions we can ask. And so what do we do in the group? Uh, Professor Rangapa mentioned it's about 20 people. And, and what I realized is, uh, to me, it's very important. That was mentioned uh, in Professor Blondel's talk before uh, as well, Dr. Norton's talk, um, this uh, interaction between academia and industry. So what I'm trying to do is to roughly have uh, half of the group working on academic topics, but then we need to see do those things actually work. And that's usually what we do with companies. Uh, because in companies, you have a real question to answer. In academia, it's quite easy to get lost in well, very academic questions. Yeah? But at some stage, you have to apply what you develop. Yeah? Does the tool work in this phenotypic screen with AstraZeneca, for example? Yeah? And this is this translational part is what we're trying to do as well. Um, and what we do um, is if we work along different uh, corners of the triangle, which I offer. Uh, the first part, and that's where our group comes from, is still mode of action analysis. Uh, we apply that, for example, to traditional medicines, or here in natural products, plant extracts. So here you have uh, a phenotypic knowledge <coughs> of particular treatments, so you know which herbs you use, which combinations. People did analytical chemistry as well, so you know to some extent which active ingredients are in them. And then the question is, how do those traditional medicines actually work? Okay, so here we are trying to find the mode of action for mixtures of compounds. And you see some of those topics in the group, they really overlap. Uh, so mode of action analysis overlaps with the traditional medicines work, we were trying to find the model of action. And, and one of the big areas uh, that we work on is mixture modeling. So we're trying to anticipate, and that was uh, partially alluded to in uh, um, Dr. Norton's work as well, uh, we're trying to simulate or analyze how do compounds work in combination. Um, and that's very important in two aspects. Uh, one is safety and one is efficacy. Safety in consumer products, for example. Uh, if you have uh, ingredients and it can be in food, it can also be uh, just uh, detergents, for example. You have combinations of compounds, and sometimes the effect of combinations of compounds is not additive. It can be synergistic, or they can pass each other out. But that's fully understood right now. And there's also the efficacy aspect. The question is, which compounds should I use which are synergistic when it comes to treating a particular disease? Um, and that's important because you have three or 4,000 compounds that are approved by the FDA. And that means you have 10 million or so combinations of compounds. Yeah? And also in those cases, activity is not additive. Yeah? Not necessarily edited. But the question is which combinations are the best ones for a particular disease. And so this is, these are the uh, areas that we cover in the group. And what we also move into now is more uh, into understanding biological data. Uh, what I mentioned is I'm a chemist. I'm very happy to be a chemist. But I completely uh, acknowledge that biology is equally important. Yeah? And you need to try to understand all of those areas to understand what does the biological readout actually mean. Yeah? Only then the chemist can design the right molecule. And so we are moving quite a lot into uh, biological readouts as well, next generation sequencing, so we can pull chemical information and information from NGS, for example, for mode of action analysis or for identifying novel compounds. Okay, but to come to the uh, scientific part of the talk, I will have three uh, short stories. The first one is on understanding phenotypes, what is the mode of action. The second one is giving me the compound to target a particular protein or to treat a particular disease. And the third part is uh, how can we actually integrate chemical and biological data um, in order to uh, select compounds in this particular case. And the reason, uh, the first part is on understanding phenotypes, give me the mode of action. So if we put this into the triangle that I was outlining before, uh, how were pharma companies actually doing drug discovery in most cases in the last two decades? What usually happened is first there were, for example, methods studies or Biological results, let's say, it can be other results as well, that implicate a target in a particular disease. So, and then you isolate the protein, you have biochemical assay, and afterwards you do a throughput screen, for example. So, you screen, uh, I was working at Novartis, so uh, they screen usually on the oral 1 million compounds uh, that were in the leg routinely uh, against an isolated protein target, usually about 50 times a year, so you have 50 million data points a year. And, and then you find uh, structures that are active against the isolated protein target. But that's a problem if you go to uh, the clinic, to humans, you have metabolism, you have uptake, and so on. But quite often, you don't see efficacy. Okay? And that's one of the problems that developed with pharma in the last uh, 20 years or so. If you go this way around, quite often you have a molecule that's either uh, they show the lack of efficacy or it's toxic. Okay? Uh, but what can we do? We can actually approach this triangle the other way around. So we can start with a combination of compounds that show phenotype. And based on the molecular structure or biological readouts, we can then infer uh, the mode of action. And the advantage is here, we have data along those edges. 
Okay, so we can exploit this knowledge that we have to identify targets or to pick compound and so on. But in this case, to identify targets. Yeah? So we exploit the data that we have in databases. We make best use of that. Develop a hypothesis, which needs to be tested afterwards. Yeah, but it's a good hypothesis. It's one that reduces the number of experiments. Um, and this concept, uh, when I started that, when I started my group five years ago or so, I thought, okay, we can predict targets, but is that enough to run a group? But actually, I realized uh, there's many situations uh, where you have data that connects a link to a time. These are just some of the examples. Uh, we work with uh, Lily, for example, on red sleep data. Um, and rats don't sleep. Uh, they do the night or so. They, they don't go every hour for half an hour or so. They basically only run around when they uh, want to mate or they, they find some food or so. Uh, and here the question is, if the red sleeps well, which bioactivity profiles against GPC us in the brain do you need? Okay. So again, a phenotype effect, red sleeps, uh, and putting a red to sleep is actually easy. The problem is actually that if you wake up, that you're not drowsy anymore. Okay, that's a challenge to sleep. But if uh, you have the link between a compound uh, and phenotype sleep, and the question is which targets are involved. There's quite a number of projects uh, where we can uh, use this concept. What I would also run second is on the traditional Chinese and Indian medicine. That we can identify how those medicines work, or at least develop a hypothesis. And one reason to analyze data right now is data is huge. It's not only sequence data. What became apparent is uh, uh, what became a, a much more important in our area in the recent past is it's not with bioactivity data in the public domain now. There used to be many companies, many of them in India, Jubilant or GPK, for example, sold bioactivity databases. They have tens of millions of data points. In. They are good databases. They are very large, but they are proprietary. You need to pay for them. And pharma companies pay millions a year uh, in US dollars for those databases. Uh, but what, what happened recently is Kendall, it's a database at the EBI. It's a public database, which contains maybe 4 million or so uh, data points right now that link chemistry to protein targets and cellular readouts. Okay? So if you're working on a particular protein target, uh, this is the resource uh, which you should use if you want to design new compounds. And you can look up which knowledge is there. For many targets, GPCRs, for example, you have thousands of active compounds in the database. Yeah? So you don't want to repeat what other people did. You want to design new compounds. And you can use all that knowledge using computational code. OK, so what, how can we use that in our case if we want to predict protein targets? What we have in the database is a list of ligands on the order of hundreds of thousands of millions of ligands, chemical structures. They are linked to usually human uh, protein targets. So we know, for example, target one is a particular GPCR. And we have, let's say, a thousand or so ligands that bind to that GPCR. You can use functional assays or binding assays with that few. And, and that model learns, if I have this GPCR, this chemistry, where I have a positively charged nitrogen, an aromatic ring, and some decoration, this type of chemistry typically binds to that GPCR. Okay? And I have a thousand examples of molecules. And what the computer learns is, which type of chemistry typically binds to that target? Which type of chemistry typically binds to that target and to that target and to all of those 1,000 human targets we have in the database? And what, what we can do then is we draw a molecule, any molecule, and the computer looks up, so to speak, goes through the list of compounds it knows, and it looks up which type of chemistry does that compound actually contain. And then the computer says, oh, it looks more similar to target 35, but it also looks similar to target 78. Then the computer is kind of for all those targets. And, and ranks the different protein targets, which are mode of action hypothesis for your particular compound. Okay? It's a relatively simple method. It takes only a second or so per molecule. So you can even screen a large database and select compounds with a desired bioactivity per molecule. Do that as well. But in this case, we use it for mode of action analysis. Give me the protein targets of a particular compound, usually a compound that's active in a phenotypic screen. And what we get from that is uh, typically this type of output. So we draw a molecule, in this case, it's a product that's on the market. And, and what you get is a list of targets out of a thousand targets or so, so only the top targets are shown, and scores. And what you see is the most likely target of Fleabag in this case is ABLE, and Fleabag targets, BCA ABLE's fusion gene. So this one has the highest score. And KIT, for example, that was mentioned uh, in the talk yesterday as well, also has a high score. That's also a true target. Okay? So the compu computer can anticipate based on data, so it's not out of thin air, it's based on data, <laughs> uh, what are the most likely protein types of that? Okay, and what do you, so here for boxes, Aurin is a pantanase inhibitor, and that's what you see in the targets as well. And what you also see is the scores drop off much more rapidly here than in this case. 
And so it can also anticipate promiscuity to some extent. And your box is slow and it's very promiscuous. It inhibits the amount of time you or something like that. Okay, and this is the output you can get from our computation of books. Okay. So if you apply that to uh, Ayurvedic and traditional Chinese medicine, that's an area where three or so PhD students in my lab are working on. I think that's a fascinating area. Um, due to many reasons. One is the history of that. Another one is the chemistry. Because natural products is interesting chemistry in that. Um, and it also those compounds are used in mixtures. And not only mixtures of compounds, mixtures of herbs. Of course, that makes it very difficult as well. And yeah? because in traditional medicines, and you use mixtures of compounds, hundreds of compounds in many cases. Sometimes they are prepared, so you grind them with a metal or so. Maybe there's oxidations or reductions taking place. There's many things that can happen, which we are not aware of. And in many cases, the metabolites are active, and so on. So it's a difficult area to work in. And but what happened in recent years is that people supplied electronic databases with ingredients, active ingredients of traditional medicines. So we know now, uh, we know, uh, know about uh, tens of thousands of compounds that are contained in traditional medicines. Okay? That's data we can use. We're not at the goal. There's many, much information is missing, but still we have lots of data we can analyze already. Okay, so I think it's a good stage uh, to be in. And what we can do now is uh, we can look into different phenotypic classes from uh, traditional medicine, and we can link that to our target space that we use in the Western world. You don't need to read the words. I will give an example later. But the concept here is we have the phenotypic space. These are the indications that are used in traditional medicine. That's the well, alternative or traditional medicine space, so to speak. We can link that to target space. These are protein names. Okay? So we can link both spaces. So it's basically uh, the Eastern and Western world, you know, the different types of, types of thinking. We can link using our analysis. And in one class of uh, the traditional medicines that we analyzed was, for example, tonifying and replenishing medicine. And if you ask someone in the West uh, what's tonifying and replenishing medicine, you will think of coffee or uh, cocaine or whatever uh, the particular background of that person is. Uh, but in the traditional Chinese medicine, um, that has a different connotation. And, but the question is, what does that actually mean in tonifying and replenishing medicine? What we did is we took all compounds from that class, we, we put them into our analysis, and these are the targets that we predict. And, and what is predicted is COX, uh, COX 1 and 2. Uh, you have different uh, sodium glucose transporters, uh, PTP1B, so phosphatase. Yeah? And what we see here is those effects, the dampen inflammation, yeah? for example, they also lower their uh, blood sugar. Yeah? And of course, those effects are tonifying and replenishing. Uh, in the long run, if you dampen inflammation, you probably have a lower risk of cancer. So that's how uh, linseed oil works, for example. And if you have lower blood sugar level, you have a lower risk of uh, getting uh, diabetes later and so on. So it, these are actually very beneficial effects. Okay? So in this way, we can rationalize. We still need to test those hypotheses, but we have a hypothesis. What do tonifying and replenishing medicines from TCM, how do they actually work? Okay? And that links those two spaces of Eastern and Western medicine. And we also looked at anti-cancer drugs used in Ayurveda. So in this case, we have two thousand compounds that will be analyzed. There's an uh, Ayurvedic and cancer drug database in electronic form. What we see here is that many of the targets that are predicted for those compounds, so that's only the top level analysis, we've also looked through that in detail. Many of the targets are actually involved uh, in uh, hormone synthesis. And what we also see is uh, steroid synthesis, which are involved in cancer progression. But what we also see is that targets such as PGP, these are the efflux pumps, and that's one of the main reasons why uh, drugs become uh, cells. Cancer cells become resistant to it through treatment as they pump out the uh, drugs. And what we also see is that secondary targets such as PGP are produced. And that's exactly the hypothesis how traditional medicines work. You have compounds that uh, have primary activity. You have also other compounds in the mixture that support that activity. For example, by blocking the FX pump. Okay? So that's the potential synergy <coughs> that we really see based on our data analysis. Okay? That rationalizes how anti cancer drugs used in Ayurveda could work. Of course, we still need to do the experiments. That's what we do with collaborators in uh, Symbiosis University. And, and one example, and that's one example from uh, the work with uh, Basapa's group, uh, Professor Rangapa's group, uh, is uh, actually data generated with uh, TFD and Manu Schaub. And so these are compounds that affect the uh, proliferation of HL6 cell lines. Some of the compounds uh, were found to be uh, very active. We also use those individual compounds. We put them into our target prediction pool. And so we just put in the compound the four ones, takes only a second or so, and then it predicts a particular uh, protein target, in this case PCL2. And what we see is that if we do Western world, we really have indications if we have compound treatment, uh, then we see a uh, lower expression of PCL2. 
So this is not a proof of the model action yet, but at least uh, it validates that there is a link between the compound uh, action and there's an uh, impact uh, on DCL2 as well. Of course, there's still some controls that need to be done and so on, but still, you have this link, generate a hypothesis, you have a much more direct way to do your experiment, you need to do the experiment, yeah, and then you can validate your model action after. This is still ongoing work as well. And so what's the take home message? We can uh, use databases uh, in order to uh, predict modes of action in order to understand compound action. But we can also turn that around, of course. Uh, we can also select compounds with a desired bioactive compound. And this is work that we were doing, for example, uh, with uh, Johnson & Johnson. And in this particular case, we were working on infectious diseases, namely HIV. And here the problem is uh, HIV is a uh, rapidly mutating uh, virus, so quite often the targets look different in every patient. Uh, so every patient is unique basically in HIV, and some patients also have different viral subpopulations. So they have different genotypes of the same virus uh, inside them. And in those cases, the question is, uh, which drug will actually pick for a patient? You can treat HIV in the sense that you can extend lifespan and so on, reduce viral load, but the question is still, which drug is the right one? Yeah? That quite often uh, involves some experimentation or prediction using computational models. And, and what we do is, uh, I don't go into detail here, but we develop new methods that are called photochemometrics methods that integrate chemical space and bioactivity space against related targets. And because it's not only one compound hit one target. I mean, compounds have bioactivity profiles. And if we take all chemical space as well as all biological space into account, we can extrapolate much better. Our model makes better use of the data. And this is always what we uh, should do. So I would even say it's the uh, 11th sim of science, uh, let's say. Yeah? They always take all data into account. Yeah? It's very important. And that's, they make best use of it. And this is what we're trying to do uh, using project and metrics models. And, and what we can do then is we can fill in missing gaps in our data. So in this case, uh, that's data from Johnson & Johnson. We have 450 compounds of them that were screened or tested uh, in 14 uh, enzyme units, <coughs> which correspond to patients. Uh, green means the uh, compound works, that's against the wild type of the virus. Red means uh, is resistant, no compound activity, so this one is a highly resistant uh, patient. And white means I don't know, but we can use the model to fill up those blanks. And, and we can also do that on a large scale. That's the great thing about our modeling approaches. For this case, uh, we had sequencing information from tens of thousands of patients. We had activity information of uh, non nuclear cell reversion scriptless inhibitors. Uh, protease inhibitors and nucleoside uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, so they bind in different sites in the enzyme. We can model all those data, so between tens of thousands of patients that our model uh, tries uh, to, to uh, model in this case. And what we see here is uh, these are the results for the different activity classes. We have a correlation between uh, experimental and predicted activity, and we see that in many cases really have good correlation. Our model does not work if we have too, little, uh, too few data funds. Yeah? So our models need data. They are quite <coughs> data hungry, so to speak. But in those cases, we can predict better than the uh, Johnson & Johnson internal models which drug works on which patient. Okay? And this really improves standards uh, that were used in industry before. We can better match drugs and patients than those kinds. Um, and uh, it, so finally, uh, what we are moving into now is more the biological area, uh, as I said. Um, so we're looking more into gene expression data and NDS data as well. And we do that for two purposes again, to pick the right compound, as well as to predict model of action. We do both. Um, and this example I have here is about picking the right compound. What we do about model of action is a uh, company called Avoca. And they are trying to find evidence how their creams and so on, how they actually work in the of skin. And what they do is they apply a uh, mix of compounds, herbal extracts actually, uh, two particular systems, and they measure NGS profiles. Okay, and we're trying to merge that with our cheminformatics uh, analysis of modes of action in order to have a combined analysis from the chemical side and the biological side. How those cosmetics work. And what we do is not only apply to pharma industry, but also be applied to. Okay, but this part here is about picking compounds. Um, we actually look at uh, in this case. And that's what I just said. We analyze gene expression data, NGS data. And we can match drugs and diseases. We also explain and predict cancer cell line sensitivity and those uh, predictive models that we uh, generate based on, uh, for example, the NCI60 uh, data provided by the NIH. Um, there's some caveats with the data set, uh, but we want to uh, we aim to 
uh, build predictive models that seems to work reasonably well in some cases. And this is the case uh, I'll show you explain. Um, so how can we use a gene expression data for picking compounds? And um, there was uh, six or seven years ago, there was the uh, connectivity map uh, published. And that was the first database that on a large scale for more than a thousand compounds provided gene expression profiles in different cells. Of course, they were also used in different concentrations, and if you have different cell lines, you run into different problems. But still, we now have uh, large scale data for uh, that link compound to gene expression profile. What we also have is in uh, gene expression omnibus, for example, for different databases with gene expression profiles of diseases. What we can match now is healthy against diseased individuals and their gene expression profiles, and we can have cell lines or other samples and treated cell lines or other samples. So we have two differences in gene expression profiles, each between healthy and disease and healthy and compound treatment. Okay, and we can match the two. And this is visualized here, so where we have different genes. And what we are looking for is a particular drug signature in gene expression space and a particular disease signature. And if they are opposite, we would suggest the first approximation, this compound might have an effect on the disease. What this uh, does not suggest is uh, the gene expression uh, change in case of disease tissues goes one way, and the drug pushes back the gene expression change or so. This is not what we claim. We only claim there's opposite signals yeah, in our data set. Yeah? This signal goes one way, this signal goes the other way, so there might be a relationship. So we can test experimentally afterwards again. We can test whether that compound is active in that particular cell line, for example. Um, and so a very good PhD student from Iran, uh, Yasama, they have excellent uh, programmers in Iran, it's a beautiful country as well. Um, and what you program is an interface where you can upload gene expression profiles as well as uh, compound induced gene expression profiles and mesh the two into various calculations. Um, and what we do now is we first look at uh, the case where there are known therapeutics are retrieved. That seems to work uh, reasonably well. Um, and what we do in the next step is, of course, we test experimentally uh, whether those compounds are active uh, in experiment prospectively. Um, and we do that both for different clusters. Uh, so we just purchase compounds that we're testing that right now uh, with our colleagues in Iran. Um, but we can also do that, for example, for stem cell, <coughs> uh, stem cell differentiation. And um, because if you have gene expression profiles between two different states, you can generally match them. Yeah? It can be diseases, but it can also be different uh, states of cells. So we try whether we can use gene expression profiles to select small molecules that induce uh, stem cell differentiation into cardiac myocytes, for example, in this particular case. So this is what we move in now. This is ongoing work which we just started, but which we're experimentally validating in the coming weeks. Okay, so to summarize, so how can computers help in medicinal chemistry? Uh, certainly in uh, three ways. The first one is, if we have a compound that shows a particular phenotypic activity, databases can tell us or suggest possible protein targets. The second case is, if we have a database and we are looking for a compound with a particular effect, that effect can be binding to a target, regulating a pathway, or it can be a phenotypic effect. The databases and computers tell us which compounds to pick. And the final part is here, uh, use all data available, chemical and biological data where possible, because only then we can make the best decision, develop the best hypothesis based on all the data that you have. So with this, uh, I would like to conclude. I would like to thank all the people in my group, uh, the various companies uh, that support our work, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Dr. Hiroshi Noh.
Associate Professor, Graduate School of Life Science, Frontier Research Center for Post Genomic Genome Science and Technology, Hokkaido University, Japan. Dr. Hinomo he is interested in development of new technologies for biomedical research and drug discovery, structural and functional analysis of glycoconjugates by organic chemistry, design and synthesis of novel enzyme inhibitors, development of novel sy reaction system toward green, green sustainable chemistry, and uh, Dr. Hinao was a visiting professor at um, the Institute of Research for Biomedicine, Barcelona, in Spain, during 2010, and uh, assistant professor at Graduate School of Life Science, Okada University, between 2006 and 2013. He was a postdoctoral fellow at the Synthetic Cellular Chemistry Laboratory, Rikane, between 2000 and 2002. He obtained his PhD in 2000. 2000 at Saitama University, Japan, MS, BS from Saitama University, Japan. Dr. Hino has been awarded several awards and fellowships, namely the best post award in February 2011, a very important paper in December, in December 2010. Excellent young researcher overseas visit under overseas visit program in December 2009. He was awarded the Japanese Society of Polymer Research Incentive Award and many more. Uh, Dr. Hino also worked at Rikin at, as junior research fellowship fellow and also at Saitama University as a research associate. With these few words, Dr. Hinao, I welcome Dr. Hinao to deliver his talk and synthesis and application of bicyclic carbohydrates to Dr. Hinao. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Memory errors. My Uh, uh, my research topic is carbohydrates. And today I plan this uh, two topics or, uh, or macrocyclic, uh, bicyclic carbohydrates. I'm sorry, this is uh, too much considered on chemistry. So I focus on memorizing uh, this today using mechanical based learning inhibitors. And today's topic is uh, mechanism based inhibitor for neural diseases as proof of novel drug design and macrocyclic neural inhibitor and its mechanism based inhibitor uh, 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 Surface is covered with carbohydrates, uh, such as bright protein and bright ribbon. And in the case of mamba, in the case of mamba, the carbohydrates are often terminated with muramic acid, so-called sharic acid. So mamba cells are covered with muramic acid. And sharic transfer since then, this uh, sharic oligopathia, okay, using synthesis sharic acid as chromium. And the distribution of shared transfers is considered to not matter. So, carbon with shared acid. So, virus, bacteria, and so forth, use this shared acid for infection and feed our cells, our blood protein. So, they use cannabinoid and Miranda to, to use shared acid. So this is a, a distribution of Miranda to hydrolyze shared oligosaccharide to uh, shared acid to release shared acid. Uh, 
Of course, uh, Mama is used uh, this RMD for common purpose. And virus, bacteria, parasitic uh, means the protozoa. And uh, fungi use normally that for infection and feed, uh, food uh, eating. Uh, this is a uh, uh, special risk selected virus, root bacteria. Uh, yes, uh, plastic, uh, mainly like protozoa, uh, uh, like Bishmania and Trubatoma. And uh, green is fungi, and this uh, charcoal is uh, mama. Uh, so, circus uh, is a very important target, and I'm promising blood type. Uh, and very interesting, interestingly, uh, structural mechanism of Shirada uh, Moramida is conserved from virus, microbiome, uh, bacteria, protozoa, and uh, mammal, like human. And they, uh, every moment that you use, try a uh, arginine to fix a carboxylate group of moramid acid, and tyrosine as nucleophile. To our it is one 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 formation uh, one portion. This is chemical mechanism. Uh, these two carboxylates also conserve among every element. This is glutamate. Activate this type of as nucleophile, and this aspartic acid uh, activate. That likes to bond as acid catalyst to form this condition state structure. So, this transition state structure is common transition uh, structure for normalization. So, this structure is common skeleton of normalization. Uh, and this is uh, very similar. Uh, this a uh, two three dehydro acetyl ceramic acid called Dana uh, has almost the same conformation. So this one was common skeleton of transition state models. So uh Zanamibir, Mirenza, Ocelotanibir, Hansi use this structure as we use skeleton. And to tell uh, this Zanamibir, Mirenza, It's then they use the <coughs> information from extra classroom. In this simple uh, so many uh, static construction of interviews. And uh, he an assist pocket of concerned assist pocket of uh, influenza viruses and uh, to emphasize the a uh, binding property of Dana structure to uh, talk and remember. However, this strategy, this uh, static structure based strategy, can apply to another program basis. So, uh, recently, many uh, researchers uh, 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 concentrated on dynamic conventional nature. And this is the uh, structural biologist uh, compared with Apple and uh, uh, the tiny form. Between these two forms, structure change uh, In this case, this acid catalyzed bearing group moved to uh, direct to amyloid portion of this. And uh, uh, in, in the case of influenza uh, neuromedics, through the NA, also uh, showed structural and uh, change 
of this acid room. So now, uh, many uh, many researchers uh, who are interested in that possible on this kind of structural change. But uh, in this, at this moment, every trial of uh, sacrifice, uh, sorry, sacrifice uh, uh, the binding property to uh, to oppose selectivity. It's a confidential change. So, some uh, and, uh, studies will be required for drug design. And uh, some Moranbes, uh, like Ibero uh, Ferrer Moranbes, don't show any structural change between apple and the salicylic In such case, uh, some method, some additional method to seeking dynamic nature is required. So I focus on mechanism based monomers in uh, with that data, uh, use this free flow type mechanism based to capture the transition state uh, attacked by hydrogen. <coughs> Until then, many research graphic data of the Moranda with Dana was reported, but no one can uh, conclude uh, glutamic acid or type with a real nuclear So, this methane uh, based inhibitor can determine the actual nuclear So, I focus on this kind, uh, this kind of work. Uh, this kind of uh, property of the best inhibitor for the uh, uh, normal that has growth of normal that we can. Yes, and in this, in this topic, I focus on the degree of prayer and this, which don't show any change between apple and the and the air as target normal that. This normal that is they produce only yeah, a limit strain of particular corridor. And so it's highly saturated number of two simple GMYA. This GMYA is the uh, acceptor of the protoxin. So it has of protoxin. And this neuron has very historical uh, tender. Uh, the, the name of neuron does was done by the study of Toyra Pichinado enzyme. And best inhibitor was reported in 1974, 40 years ago. And crystal structure was reported in 1995. So, very difficult, uh, sort of important in modern that, but every trial includes structure based graph design for VCNA. Eight to seven. It's 40 years old part. So, I focus on this class of noyland based inhibitor. This class of inhibitor was reported in 1990. And the mechanism is uh, this agricon group is activated after hydrolysis to form microacid structure. We capture the nuclear part in acid. We stop the heart. So I designed this active active uh, reactive group and protein moiety. I add protein moiety and uh, pro, uh, inhibit the enzyme, then protein dilation and protein amount. Where where is the binding site? to determine where the binding is like this. Lamelin for the dilation. This is dilation mixture. Take of the dilation mixture. And after anti-dancing one, purification is one, and determine the shape of the marastrophone to show the R effect sequence. And the and both D and R are rare. And they prepare the topology. Here is the level residue, this arginine and aspartame. 
as far as doing uh, here is Here is the data. Uh, uh, very interesting. This rubber residue is 20% away from analytic portion. So, here must be dynamic na nature. This loop must uh, move here to recognize as we can do. But, Harshim Lion in the st uh, static structure, Harshim Lion covered this structure. So, how are we? Uh, binding form to the same structure. So, I just think Harshim Lion can, uh, can dis uh, dis disappear and move this angle motion. It's hidden in this end line. So, I think here is a novel tire, inefficient tire, on this end line. So, I design uh, this direction to inhibit this motion. So, I, uh, since I, based on this idea, uh, I prefer focus brown graphic. Only 266 by the and uh, I, uh, I choose eight compounds from first screen and three compounds, these three compounds from second screen. You see, these three are the compounds I have heard. These compounds are dependent on structure. So, a promiscuous inhibition. So I checked uh, the data to tell the truth. This mechanical inhibitor inhibitor uh, but uh, inhibiting property to lose uh, in the present retard. Because this algorithm will bind with the hydrophobic loop just by hydrophobic loop. And my, uh, but uh, ultimately, these three molecules uh, don't affect by the uh, 2000 base assay. Shows these signal that means one by one by one. And this is the KI value of the, uh, this inhibitor among the post value. But unfortunately, this inhibitor can surface their uh, panel. So I focus on the pro inhibition property, selectivity of this compound. Uh, <coughs> this new compound has very high specificity for which a bibliopera normal base, but one and done don't have such kind of So back to the first analysis. Uh, one targeting this group has a starting point. But my compound target is hydrophobic loop. So, combining the structure can improve this uh, property. So, a uh, four step uh, the, uh, conversion from HANA for this compound. And analyze the digital property. Uh, so, 73 nanomolar. And I got the best inhibitor for the uh, sub uh, uh, basic for 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 base. So I got this lead compound. So then I tried the lead optimization from uh, M26 sulfur. Eliminating this geometry group don't change the property and also this particular okay. But uh, this amide bond, this phenyl group, this triazole means it's important for inhibition. So here, this is the minimum structure for inhibition. So next, I, uh, I, uh, I uh, uh, we did a uh, docking simulation using this uh, this compound. And the target amylase residue is this two acidic residue around this hydrophobic uh, 
commodity. So, uh, introduce I'm in a group like Apple and the And yeah, computer simulation they also position to the best computation position. But I don't believe uh, in that way. <laughs> so I uh, I don't believe this information. So I I prefer every uh, position of the computation. In the case of this uh, group, and all the versions of the best in this time. But in the case of this N group, meta and para, beta are also. And about 30 and 50 number are they are in the next I uh, focus on, uh, on the uh, mechanism, how to inhibit this loop by the modification group. And that uh, here is calcium ion sandwiched by target to acidic amino acid residue. So, uh, this modification group has to compete with this calcium ion. Uh, I focus on the calcium ion configuration. Uh, this VGNA is calcium dependent, uh, uh, dependent uh, enzyme. So I use this carb region to analyze the calcium dependency. And uh, uh, Dana and Fana, the inhibition property was Decreases by the decreasing uh, calcium ion concentration, but this MR6 heat or more uh, rather enhanced the inhibition property. So, uh, this uh, moiety, uh, moiety uh, competes with this calcium ion. And, uh, Structural research is here. Here is a catalytic acid residue, and uh, this root has catalytic acid residue, and this calcium ion uh, stabilizes this root. So here is the essential calcium ion. But uh, it, from this result, this calcium is the essential calcium ion. Uh, uh, the difference of the uh, calcium ion concentration are the uh, enzyme substrate binding, uh, dana and pana binding, but not change for analysis. So, this is a uh, summary of the first topic. A uh, mechanism based routing information suggests that the hidden dynamics nature of the for the drug design to afford token and high selectivity of pana and M76. And the reload optimization of this compound uh, for best inhibitor, MR6 and MR5. And MR6 acts as a calcium ion independent inhibitor versus the calcium ion binding site. So I use the second topic, macrocyclic neural inhibitor, and it makes the inhibitor property.
affected property. So this is as I felt this is not suitable for the structure. So I reanalyzed the mechanics <coughs> of neurons. Neurons by a recognized substrate, then forms the cobalt bond with sharp acid to release the agglutinin. And in this a uh, in our uh, mechanism inhibitor, this agglutinin activates in this. Uh, but uh, this uh, agricon uh, binds just by hydrophobic property, so easily in this option from the active side to, uh, under, to, for, uh, to react with water to enact. So I want to, uh, I want to change this property by microcyclization like this. And this macrocyclation, of course, about the release of this activated agricultural group. And the design is based on static structures, like this 9 to 100 question direction. And I use rings closing protein diagnosis, like this. And uh, the form uh, and I checked the property of this hybrid inhibitor okay. for this okay. uh, bacteria, the eukaryote, and the viral inhibitor. Uh, in common, competitive inhibitor bonds affect reactivation time, but a uh, mechanism inhibitor affects reactivation time. And uh, the time dependent uh, area is a reversible condition. So uh, I check which CNA with this uh, macrocyclic compound in the present uh, detergent. And as I uh, thought, uh, this compound works as a mechanism uh, best in here. And uh, as say for uh, bacterial neuronalysis shows a uh, very strange uh, data towards the uh, hormonal neuronalysis. This uh, neuronalysis uh, recognized as complex but not work as uh, So I checked the property of, the, uh, of this uh, neuronalysis and this neuronalysis this uh, also reported as abnormal neurons really having a very high k plus value. That means uh, that mean, uh, this uh, salmonella neurons, only this salmonella neurons uh, release this shared acid inhibitor uh, complex from active site before activate uh, before formation of one dividing between uh, reacting group. But another group acts uh, as irrational inhibition. And could be as a uh, uh, most sensitive inhibitor, a uh, uh, neural less for this inhibitor. And this is a summary of this topic. And this is the summary of all topics. And uh, this work was uh, Sometimes uh, in a professor in Shimura's laboratory. And uh, Dr. Kai did uh, this macrocyclic inhibitor study, most uh, proposed this uh, protomic study. Takasu uh, did a prepared uh, uh, and uh, analyzed a uh, uh, focus library. And Vishnu Niyoshi uh, did a big optimization of the uh, I uh, need a compound and uh, computation mission and uh, protein expression and uh, uh, detergent based assay and especially the dependent assay uh, during his master for student. And uh, he's a clear collaborator uh, with uh, neural gains and uh, preparation of which uh, And uh, here's a problem. Mm. And uh, support is a very beautiful, very cold, but very beautiful. 
a queda é, por causa do universo nearby a protection. And I, I, uh, we were here uh, 30 minutes ago away uh, by road. That's a very, very nice place. And uh, we have the uh, 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 PhD uh, funding program. So if you have interest in our uh, group and our university, please try this uh, program. Already, uh, Already, a uh, whole uh, student from our university uh, but, uh, under this program, and the uh, uh, next next order of professional students come to our uh, university. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Mawa. Uh, if there is any discussion, of course, you can have outside. And once again, at the end, you have the answer. So, uh, thank you once again for uh, your nice presentation. Thank you. I request our uh, honorable instance to present a moment of the floor. Uh, once again, I thank all the speakers, including Mr. Tom Blender, Mr. Uh, Peter Horton, Dr. Bender, and uh, Dr. Hinova for having presented their uh, new research inventions to our uh, participants. Uh, again, I once again I thank them on behalf of the University of Mysore and that may one behalf. Thank you. Once again. I now request Professor B. S. Vishwanath to hand over a token of momentum to the session chair. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this ends the first technical session of the day. We shall now soon begin with the second technical session. Thank you. We now begin with the second technical session. This session will be chaired by Sir Tom Blender and Professor H. S. Prakash. Sir Tom Blender is from Department of Biochemistry, University of Cambridge. His area of specialization includes molecular architecture of living organisms and developing extensive software for structural bioinformatics. He has abundantly contributed to academia as well as many biotech and pharmaceutical industries. A hearty welcome to you, sir. Professor H.S. Prakash is Professor in Biotechnology and is currently the Chairman of the Department of Biotechnology, University of Mysore. His area of specialization includes plant and microbial biotechnology, molecular diagnostics, metagenomics, cell and tissue culture technology. He has published over 120 articles in reputed scientific journals and has guided many PhD students. A hearty welcome to you, sir. It's my pleasure to be um, invited uh, to chair this session, and uh, in particular uh, for the speakers that we have today. So uh, the first speaker is uh, Dr. Sati Raghavan, who um, is uh, from the Department of Biochemistry in the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. And I'm particularly pleased to be able to, um, uh, to do this as uh, about a year or so ago, one of my um, 
postdoctoral researchers, Dr. Takesh Lakshi came to me in a very, very excited state uh, about a paper that he just read, uh, which was um, uh, very close to our own interests. And as we were both going to Bangalore about a year ago, we were able to meet him, discuss with him the very exciting uh, work that he's doing. So, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Raghavan was, um, uh, he, he, he did his BSc in zoology in, in Kerala, his PhD in uh, Varanasi in India, and then he went uh, in postdoctoral research to the Norris Cancer Center in the University of Southern California. Since 2006, he's been assistant professor at the Department of Biochemistry in the Indian Institute of Science, as I mentioned before. And um, I think a particular note is that he has the Batnaga Prize uh, in 2013, which is a fantastic recognition. Many, many congratulations on that. I, I don't have anything to give you at the moment, but I think something is coming. <laughs> But, um, and uh, has many other uh, um, honours, especially in the last year, he's also been elected as a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences. So what a fantastic way uh, to be developing your career. So the um, uh, lecture today is on uh, cutting and pasting gain, uh, insights into DNA repair, oncogenesis and cancer. Uh, um, thank you, Professor Brendel, for uh, this uh, introduction. Uh, and it's my pleasure to be here, and I also thank Professor Rangapa uh, and other organizers and my students um, for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and present uh, my work here. Before I start, uh, just a uh, set up of things. Uh, just like uh, uh, what Professor Wendell said, you know, about a year back we met, and then fortunately you know, we uh, set up some small collaborations. Uh, same way, uh, when I joined the IIC, which was in, uh, which was, uh, in 2006, um, I did not have, uh, I mean, whatever I worked till then, it was purely, you know, biology, more on cancer and mechanisms and things like that. I did not have any sort of uh, experience or expertise with uh, you know, chemistry other than what I, little thing I learned during my uh, higher secondary and BSc. Uh, so I was one of the, uh, one of the you know, maybe two or three chemists who introduced me to the area of uh, chemical biology. And you'll see some of the data what I'm uh, going to show. Uh, how that uh, uh, collaboration or interaction which was set up at that time helped me to develop, uh, you know, like take forward my laboratory. And then, uh, as you know, many times, you know, when we look for collaborators, see, collaboration is always nice. At the same time, it can be sometimes tricky, right? If you don't find the correct collaborators. Uh, but Professor Rangapa turned out as one of the collaborators, uh, you know, as I said, we started the initial part of my career. And still, we continue to. <laughs> you know, that's what I'm going to say. Uh, still, we continue to collaborate. And then, you know, I think we have published more than probably 10 or 15 papers. Published. So that's something uh, I consider as great. And then I'm sure we hope to collaborate further. Thank you, Professor Shankar. So let me start my presentation, uh, which is kind of titled here: Cutting and Pasting Game. So what is this cutting and pasting? See, the cutting and pasting which I'm referring here is with respect to chromosomes of DNA. When I say cutting is a breakage of DNA, and then pasting is like you know, after a break DNA has to join. Sometimes it joins the right way, sometimes it joins the wrong way. Uh, both can have some sort of impact. And that's what the, the rest of the topic we're focusing inside into the DNA repair, uh, oncogenesis, and how uh, you know, this concept can be used for uh, uh, you know, developing uh, new DNA repair inhibitors as well as uh, 
or its implication with respect to against therapeutics. So today's presentation I have split it into like, a couple of two, three small sections. First part I'll talk about uh, secure basic research where I'll try to talk about um, uh, things what we are doing related to uh, oncogenesis, particularly relevant to chromosomal translocations. The second part I'll talk about DNA repair and then as I said uh, how that can be used as a uh, cancer therapeutic target. As you all know, genetic alteration in the DNA could result in uh, cancer and particularly when such genetic alteration takes, mm -hmm. uh, takes place within mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, DNA mm -hmm. Now, among different types of genetic alteration, there are many like, you know, mutations, mutations, deletions, duplications, and then chromosomal translocation. You know, if you mm -hmm. consider chromosomal mm -hmm. translocation as one of the you know, most uh, common uh, cause for uh, the address of many type of cancers. Now, if you look at here, this is, uh, I mean, I'm sure you heard about, we have heard about the chromosomal translocation. These are kind of chromosomal abnormalities, which are uh, normally or uh, characteristically present in leukemia and lymphoma. Uh, in fact, till very recently, maybe till uh, somewhere uh, around 2000, people thought, thought that you know, such translocations are seen only in leukemia and lymphoma. But that's not the case. Now, there are a lot of evidence to suggest that such translocations can also be seen in other type of cancers like uh, sarcoma and person. So now, what are chromosomal translocations? These are nothing but exchange of chromosomal arms or swapping of chromosomal arms as shown here. So this is a translocation between chromosome 14 and 18. So what happened during this translocation is, if there's a break at chromosome 14 and the second one at chromosome 18, the arms can be swapped. That is what the simple definition of translocation. Now, what are we interested with respect to chromosomal translocation? Our interest is to understand the mechanism by which chromosomes break during this process. In other words, when I say chromosomal break, what I mean is obviously the DNA which is present within the chromosome. How that works? Is it something to do with the DNA structure? You know that normally DNA is in B form. So is it something to do with the DNA structure, you know, some sort of alternate DNA structure present in those breakpoints in the patients? Or is it something to do with the you know, proteins or enzymes specifically seen in those cell types where such translocations are seen? Now, another interesting aspect about this translocation is you look at two of them. One of the partners, uh, one of the partner chromosome involved is normally chromosome 40. Let's say 14, 18 translocation, 8, 14, 11, 14, 10, 14. So you invariably find, not always, but mostly, you find uh, chromosome 14 as one of the partners. If you look a little more carefully, you find that the locus which breaks during this translocation chromosome 18 is something called IGH or immunoglobin heavy chain locus. So this locus is something very important uh, with respect to VDJ recombination. And that is the process by which antibody diversity is generated uh, by rearranging variable diversity and joining cycles. Uh, there are two concepts I wanted to introduce here uh, just to, in order to make sure that you are following the rest of my presentation. One is something called a recombination signal sequences or RSS. These are some specific sequences like a station in you know, like they recognize some specific sequences. Same way, uh, these are some conserved sequences uh, which consists of a heptamer and monomer and separated by a spacer. So the length of the spacer, if it is 12 nucleotide, it is called a 12 RSS. Otherwise, uh, if it is 23, it is called a 23. So normally during VDJ recombination, these two signals has to come together. And then there is a protein called RAG, RAG1 and RAG2, recombination activating gene 1 and 2. It is also called VDG recombinase. So these are, these protein is uh, nucleus, site specific nucleus which specifically introduce a uh, naked high prime end of the heptamer. So that's why this process is called site-specific recombination. And once a nick is introduced, which can be converted as a herpin later, and, and then uh, there are other nucleus within the cells, which cut those to introduce DNA double strand breaks as shown here. And then finally, those uh, breaks are joined to form a productive coding joint. And that's what, uh, in the uh, you know, finally result in the functional antibody. Now, what happens is, during translocation, during chromosomal translocation, sometimes 
uh, is B or D and J phase to join. So if there is happened to be a second break at another chromosome, in this case obviously it's chromosome 18, and the gene involved is something called BCL2 antiphotonic G. Um, so if there is a second break, so chromosome 18 then join with the chromosome 14, and what happens is this brings the immunoglobin heavy chain enhancer close to BCL2 gene. So that now the, the BCL2 gene uh, started expressing in uh, high, higher level and that could re result in oncogenesis. And there are other processes in between which I won't know. Now one of the very interesting aspects uh, what we have seen when we started this study based on literature was, so as I said BCL2 gene is a, it's a big gene, it's a huge gene, it's more than 200 kg size. But the breakpoint in the patients is focused in a very small region is called uh, major breakpoint region, and these are all each each dot here indicated in different uh, in, in patients. Now, in one of our studies, this was actually my postdoc study, uh, some uh, about almost going to be eight, nine, ten years back. In fact, ten years back, it's 2014. So, so what we found out was the the, the major breakpoint region forms unusual DNA structure. We found at that time it was non BDNA. And not only that, the, the enzyme rag, which normally cleaves DNA based on sequence, can now cleave based on DNA sequence. Or sorry, DNA structure. This was two, two important findings of uh, that study. And then later, when I started my lab in IIC, one of the first questions what we asked was what is the nature of the non BDNA structure, what we are talking about at that time? So, Mudura Nambiar in my laboratory, uh, she went on to show that. The one of the structure what we were talking at that time was something called G quadruplexes. So G quadruplexes are the alternate DNA structures normally formed in structures of bonds. And there is an unusual type of halogen bond involved there, which is called hoosting halogen bond. So she can, I, I won't explain this slide uh, uh, in great detail, but she used many biophysical, biochemical uh, methods to show that uh, a G quadruplex is formed uh, at major breakpoint region. So based on that, we come up with a model, as shown here, to explain the G1418 chromosome transformation. Now, the chromosome 14 breaks by using VDJ recombination, which I already told is the sequence-specific mechanism on the hectam and anabar by RAS. Whereas in case of chromosome 18, the same protein RAS cut the DNA, but using an independent property. That's where it uh, replaces at least the G1418 and then results in uh, the transformation. So now at this stage we ask the question, you know, so, so we have a new we have identified a new property for us, which is structure specific nucleus actually. So we ask the question, is it something specific for this cancer or this transformation, or is it something a general property of this protein itself? So what we found out was the um, when we use different types of artificial uh, substrate, the protein can keep always uh, in a single standard double standard transition, irrespective of uh, irrespective of uh, whether it's coming from uh, a translocated region or not. The only uh, puzzling thing at that time was this asymmetry. Let's say when it keeps the top strand, top and bottom strand, this is this is you know, this in vitro study by using purified rat protein. Uh, there is asymmetry with, with respect to cleavage. The top strand is cleaved efficiently, bottom strand the, the cleavage efficiency is for This was something which we could not explain at that time. So um, like Abdi Khan and a PhD student in the laboratory, went on to show that there's a reason for that asymmetry. See, if cytosines are present in the single standard region, as shown here, of this heterodiverse DNA, so then the rack can efficiently cleave both top and bottom strands. And in fact, this cleavage could uh, result into a, a double strand brace, which is, as, you know, uh, as I said earlier, it's a prerequisite of generation of transfer. Now, if timings are present at the single standard region, again it can cut both top and bottom strand. So the efficiency is many fold weaker. And if purines are present, it's almost uh, cannot keep. So, Abhi went on to show that uh, with respect to RAG1, there is a specific domain which is called NBD, non armor uh, binding uh, uh, region. Uh, once you remove that, once if you delete out that, then something interesting. The physiological property of RAG is completely uh, abolished. In other words, the, the property, uh, the sequence specific property of RAG is completely gone, whereas uh, the pathological property, which is the structure specific activity, 
is still very good. So now we are working on to identify the domain responsible for uh, you know, the, the stress with regard. So Nishana, uh, she's another PhD student. What she did is she placed the monomer. If you remember uh, that media recombination sequence, there's a heptamer and monomer. Monomer is the sequence normally that binds in the DNA so that it can uh, then later induce the cleavage. So once we place such monomer next to this kind of a structure, what she found, it, found out was even the efficiency of cleavage goes many fold higher. Not only that, uh, when monomer is present, even those purines which was otherwise not cleavable by that become now sensitive to the protein. So what is the implication of this study? The implication uh, is very simple. Uh, like say, if there is a monomer, like say our genome is about a billion you know, nucleotides. So if there is a monomer happen to be present in some of the CPG sites, because you know that spontaneous generation of cytosine can convert you know, the C to U, that will be a GU mismatch, or if it's a methylated C, it could be a GT mismatch. So now, once you have those kind of single nucleated mismatches present, then if there happen to be um, uh, non-armor present, then that could be that, that could be sensitized to that. And this will be a, this will help us to explain a lot of genomic instability, which is normally seen in import cells, because RAX are normally expressed only BLPs. And uh, that we did a bioinformatics study to really show that uh, how often you find in translocation breakpoint sites uh, such kind of neuronics. So that was something interesting which is uh, yet to be published. So this is one of the hybrid structures I talked about, g but there are other forms of uh, structures as well, which currently we are investigating uh, with respect to uh, proximal translocations. Now, uh, Vijay and Mutula, they went on to ask, because he, in case of 14-18, we found that these default recursors are the one which make from some 18 project. We asked the question, how often these kind of default motifs are seen in other type of translocation? Because there are more than you know, 1,000 examples of uh, different translocations seen in different, different cancers. So this is something interesting. Shit. They found out, it's pure bioinformatics study, but we, they found out that more than 40% of translocation breakpoint, uh, either at right at in the breakpoint site or flanked by such default reverse forming sites, which was something interesting, and uh, they published uh, just a cover paper. Um, so in this study, what we did is we took one of those predictions. <laughs> so we thought, let's test uh, uh, one of those predictions, and we tried to validate. So the example what we had taken was it's a 10 protein translocation, which is normally seen in uh, some of the T cell leukemia, and the gene involved is something called a Hoxilla. Now, if you look at these are the patient breakpoint region, they flanked by two G quadruplex forming motifs. This is something unique. So now the sequence what you are seeing here is obviously cytosine, uh, stretches of cytosine, but you need to made in that in the complementary strand. This is going to stretches of guanine. So what Murano and Murdula did was they just simply designed oligomers spanning those regions, uh, those G stretches, as well as flanking, I mean, uh, complementary cytosines. <laughs> And run a, uh, on a simple page for amide gel in presence and absence of potassium. Because as you may know, potassium is one of the uh, ions which can uh, stabilize the robust formation. What they found out was something very interesting. If you look at here, in a minus potassium you know, TB gel, the uh, both cytosins and guanine, cytosins and guanine move more or less with a similar mobility. But the moment you add potassium, the mobility of the guanine. Uh, Strands are it's much faster, and what we think is this is because this region sequence can fold into an intramolecular G quadruplex. So that make the make the DNA to move faster. Now we went on to show that if you mutate the stretches of guanines one by one, what you see is only wild type sequence can provide that kind of a mobility shift. In none of the other cases. There are some other bands which if somebody has uh, interest, I'll explain. And we use the circular diagram to show that indeed this region forms the G quadruplex. This is very well accepted that 260 uh, in a single standard decoder forming motif can give maximum absorption to. So that's all uh, on a single standard DNA uh, in an in vitro system. But then you know that normally DNA within the cell is obviously in the uh, context. So we ask the same question what happens if you move this region to a double standard uh, context? What, what, what happens? So we call this. Uh, uh, G-quadruplex forming motif into a plasmid, 
did a simple primary relationship assay. The way assay work is, uh, the primary relationship is more or less like uh, PCR, except that uh, you know, PCR you use two primers, here you use one primer. So basically we measure the DNA, and then um, primer binds, and then if there is a structure formation as shown here, then this may result a your post -touch. So now if you look at the data, very interesting. This is a primer what we used. This is a very nice pose at the region where exactly the G protocols motif is present. In some cases, the parameterization goes you know, to the full extent as well. Now, if you look at the complementary strand where there is no guanines are present, then you don't find those kind of things. And this is kind of uh, reproducible with both those G protocols from motifs. If you remember, there was a region 1 and region 2. Uh, so once such structure is formed, the complementary strand is supposed to have single standard region. That is what is shown here by everyone who is And we went on to show that even within the cell, by using a reporter assay system, even within the cell, this kind of structure can be formed uh, by using a GFD based assay system. Probably I will explain the detail. And about uh, 50 percent reduction. And once we mutate those sequences, then we go back to. And finally, within the genome, by using sodium bisulfate assay, we showed that indeed, uh, you know, we can provide the evidence for So that's all pure data. Now comes the hypothesis. Like, how do you explain? And now what we have is we showed that two independent decoders are formed at those regions, flagging the patient record. So now we can do uh, the hypothesis that somehow, if these two regions can interact, which we still don't know how, which we are working on. Then the sensitive or the breakout region comes exactly, you know, or close to the main region, and that can be the target for the so This book is just published a uh, couple of months back in NCT, again, as a cover for that. Okay, so that was a, I know that, uh, so what we were trying to talk so far was uh, some simple thing, how DNA is, uh, how DNA or the chromosome breaks during the of those transformation. So some of the mechanism I was just trying to explain. Uh, now, once break, uh, once DNA break, as I said, you know, it has to get rejoined. It could be either by DNA repair, as shown here. This is an example of uh, DNA double strand breaks. Both strands are dropping in close vicinity. That is what is a double strand. So once uh, it happens, it could result into DNA repair most of the time, and that's why all of us are very happy sitting here. So that's uh, that will help to maintain the integrity of genome. And say if there is a misrepair, as I just said, like say it could result in translocation, mm -hmm. then you know wrong things could result in translocation, and then obviously that is the then, uh, disease condition. But now that if there is no repair, which means it result in the accumulation of DNA breaks, that could activate apoptosis or program the uh, cell. Uh, Professor Brander already explained this slide, uh, so I don't need to really go into that. There are two different pathways. One is homologous recombination. Correct this kind of DNA double strand break, uh, break or non homologous formation or NHEJ. So, NHEJ, people believe that NHEJ can occur all through the cell cycle, whereas uh, HR is kind of more restricted to platelets and GPS. So, now during NHEJ, there's a protein called Q, Q70 and Q80. So, this is a heterodharma which can you know, bind to the broken DNA and protects the ends from other nuclease action, as well as this. Binding helps the recruitment of uh, rest of the DNA repair machinery to the um, to the to the repair sites. There are many enzymes involved in this. I don't think I'll go into the details. The only thing I want to emphasize here is there's a the ligase involved here, which is called ligase four. So there are three mammalian ligases: ligase one, ligase three, and ligase four. And ligase four is the one which helps during uh, energy day. And ligase four alone is quite uh, inactive. The help of external fund XRC for you know, it improves the activity significantly. So now in our laboratory, we have developed a system uh, to measure energy. So the way we do is we break open the cell and then you know get the protein out. And for that we do ammonium sulfate precipitation so that all the cellular proteins are present. And then we just use artificial DNA substrate containing DNA double strand break to study the uh, join between the uh, so now this is a 75 mark. So if two molecules join, so you have a dimer there that is uh, about 150. So this is a schematic presentation. Here you can see that the monomer and then the dimer and trimer and you know, other few levels of molecules. So this is the one of the experiments we try to test the efficiency of energy in different uh, rat tissues. So what we found is, like, see, testis, uh, thymus, and uh, lamb process very efficient energy. 
uh, some, some of the terminally differentiated uh, tissues like heart, uh, they have uh, much lower level of uh, energy. In one of the uh, other studies, Sadish uh, went on to show that in some of the cancer cells, particularly where BCP is overexpressed, then NHJ is down the region. So in our, uh, uh, our study along with another work showed that, in fact, this BCL2 can interact with the co-protein, which helps in uh, bringing down the energy. I think this can have, again, uh, impacts with respect to generation of uh, secondary chromosomal uh, rearrangements in the family in different cases. OK, so, so this is almost where I am reaching to the end, maybe another uh, five to ten minutes. And this is the work where uh, uh, you know, Brandon was referring at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, so we asked the question, can we use, uh, you know, uh, can we inhibit the DNA repair? And then can we use that as a therapeutic modality with respect to cancer? So there are multiple reasons for that. One is there are many uh, cancers where DNA repair proteins are uh, unregulated. And then there is also, uh, there are uh, radio resistant cancers or tumor resistant cancers where, uh, where some of the NHL proteins are unregulated. Uh, so if there is a way we can block the gene repair in those cancer cells. So as I said earlier, it will result in the um, accumulation of DNA breaks, and then the end result will be the activation of process. So we thought um, we, we, need to, we want to select ligase 4 as the target for this study, because that is what is one of the critical enzymes involved in this pathway. When we started this study, it was about three years back. At that time, the crystal structure of ligase 4 was uh, not developed, especially the, the DNA binding domain of uh, uh, the structure of DNA binding domain of ligase 4 was not developed. So we decided to go with the homology. We collaborated with Professor Yadin Zai, the director of IT and this group. So let me tell you now. So this work, I mean, I'm just going the other way around now. Uh, this work is published. Uh, about a year back now, uh, and I think within one week, uh, the, there was another paper published in Cell Reports, wherein they crystallized uh, the DNA binding domain of like this for, uh, and then followed by uh, Professor Brandel's group, I think two independent groups now published. So, so, so. Anyway, to start with, at that time we did not know, so we went with the homology modeling. And also, we used uh, some of the known ligase inhibitor, which was from Tom. Uh, um, Alan Tomkinson's uh, group, where uh, they come up with some of the uh, ligase inhibitor. We use those information and the information derived from the homology model. I saw it done by Professor Edith And then we collaborated with the chemist. In this case, uh, it was uh, Professor uh, hmm? uh, uh, Subhash Karki's group. Yeah. So we come up with a series of yeah. molecules. But I also yeah. need to tell that we got a little lucky yeah. with respect to this. But Maybe we will discuss it. More later. So we had a series of inhibitor generators. Then uh, across all of these, we have already in the lab. So the DNA repair assay system I just explained. What we did was we used some of those inhibitors to screen. Um, uh, you, we used this NHG assay system, which I just described, to screen those inhibitors. So now, if you look at here, this is a normal reaction. This is a substrate. And if two molecules join, I said it can be dimer, trimer, and so on. Now, if you add the inhibitors, you see that um, these inhibitors, different inhibitors can block the reaction at different efficiency. And then we found that ACR7 was one of the most efficient one among, uh, among uh, we have testers. And uh, we went on to show that, Munal went on to show that it uh, doesn't matter any type of DNA double We tested four or five different types of DNA double strand breaks. Uh, in all the cases, you can see there's a some sort of a concentration dependent uh, decrease uh, with respect to the uh, NHEJ. And we also used a plasmid based assay system, which was kind of I standardized during my PhD time. And even there, uh, we find a similar kind of uh, We used the like this one inhibitor as a control, and the same assay. See, there we don't find the, you know, the kind of inhibition otherwise yours. Now, the drawback of this study is that it was all done by using crude extract, where all the proteins are there. Okay. Although we find uh, what we are looking for. So that's where we uh, went on to purify our express and purify like this for the And then did the similar kind of assay. You can see that again, um, 
one of the MML model which was not responsive. So the other case, it was kind of difficult to evaluate that. And what you can see is with the, again, at the seven day point, to treat the control, this is the black here, and SCR7 treated, there's not much effect. But uh, once if you use radiation plus SCR7, from the in black and white, you see that there's a significant improvement, which is even uh, announced with the increase in number of days. And this was also tested in uh, X vivo cell line. I think these two slides I'm going to skip. The bottom line is only uh, one thing, the how the, how this inhibitor induced the cell death. And we found out that it activates the intrinsic pathway of uh, trousers. This is the final model I want to explain. When uh, once you treat with ACR7, we believe that it interferes with the binding of uh, like this four uh, accessory four complex to the DNA, which result in the uh, accumulation of DNA breaks inside the nucleus, and that results into the activation of uh, trousers. This work was published in Cell, uh, or now it's exactly one year uh, back. And uh, the, the best part of uh, this slide is, you know, it's perfectly fit for the theme of this uh, meeting today. You know, this is where chemistry meets biology, and then, you know, if you have uh, very good collaborations, uh, how this could, uh, you know, like, how you can maximize your effects, that was something. And it was Redindra and group did the bioinformatics. Uh, chemistry is done by one of the colleges in uh, Bangalore, and the imaging, and this is my group. Manal was the person who did most of the work. Uh, this is my group members, and a lot of those people I have already referred, so I don't need to again take their names. And my collaborators, which include uh, Riva, see actually Riva is also my wife. Uh, she kind of helped with uh, in a different aspect of different problems, and she's faculty in ITAP. And then there are many other people, as uh, already I mentioned, Professor uh, Randapa and uh, Professor Brandon, his name is not here. We just started some university. And then there are many other people. In fact, uh, this work had generated quite a bit of interest. Uh, see, that's where uh, we also met uh, sometime early January last year. Um, so now many people are testing this molecule at different, uh, different cancer models uh, and primary cell lines. You know, basically, we, you know, we, we have not reached anywhere to think, even think about clinical trials and also for that we need to do a lot more of things, particularly modifying this uh, molecule itself. So, um, so, so that's where I wanted. Okay, I did not thank. Uh, yeah, this is very important slide because uh, all funding agencies uh, without that we could not have done anything. I'm really grateful for the all funding, all different funding agencies, especially on Leukemia um, uh, Research Foundation from the US and uh, the Memorial Trust from the UK. They all helped me at the beginning stage of my career, and then the other Indian part from the Eagles. Thank you very much for your patience. And well, that's fantastic uh, amount of work, and very, very, very exciting. Um, I, I guess we're pulling behind time. It's probably my fault at the beginning. Um, but um, we have a special um, uh, thanks. So. Yeah. Satish Raghavan probably in his talk has mentioned that uh, he do have a very good collaboration with uh, uh, our Vaishnava Swiss group of Sectors Rangapa, that is from the University of Mysore. And uh, recently, because of his uh, work of the years in our great Patnava, and uh, Professor Rangapa mentioned that uh, Star would like Professor uh, uh, Temple should uh, honor him in fact on, on this uh, symposium. Please. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Thank you, Sir Tom Lendl and Professor H.S. Prakash. We now continue with the next lecture. Right. So, that was a very good session to chair. <laughs> very exciting. And uh, the second speaker in this uh, uh, is uh, Dr. Alan Van Kuba. And um, he uh, earned his PhD in the University of North Texas, um, where he discovered a very important protein, uh, higher R. I, I'm particularly interested in this because we've been looking at it in the context of TB, although this was um, in another organism, uh, a very important um, regulatory molecule which may be a good target for various um, therapeutics. But he then uh, uh, moved on on his postdoctoral work into cancer research, uh, so making the bridge that I was discussing this morning between uh, microbes and uh, uh, therapeutics and, uh, and cancer. Um, we had a fellowship um, on the role of nuclear receptors and uh, transcriptional regulation of the human uh, myeloperoxidase. And then after that, Dr. Kumar relocated to Singapore to join the Faculty of Medicine at NUS, that's the National University of Singapore, where he's an independent principal investigator. So uh, again, a very impressive uh, career and some very exciting discoveries. And he's going to uh, give us a talk uh, now, it's an invited talk, um, on targeting um, MNSOD in basal breast carcinoma using agonists of PPAR, a new strategy for enhancing chemosensitivity. Right, now I've got to do that. Um, I'd like to first thank the chair for the introduction. And I have a mic. Thank you. And I would like to also thank Professor Rangapla for, uh, for inviting me here. Uh, it's a very interesting story how I met Professor Rangapla. I met him in Singapore. He and uh, Professor Tapas Kundu came to Singapore and Professor Kundu in, uh, introduced me to Prof. Rangapa. And he looked at me and says, uh, I'm hungry. <laughs> and, uh, and now we are in Singapore and, and you guys are mainly Chinese. Yeah, because the majority of the population are Chinese. I want to eat automatic Chinese food. I said, all right. So I brought it to the most expensive Chinese so restaurant in Singapore. Hmm? <laughs> but I guess it, it must have satisfied this hunger because you know they say the, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. So hence he invited me here. Now my life is not a chemistry lab. So we are focused more on identifying new targets and, and providing enough preclinical evidence to, to show that this target is coming. We also uh, we also work on identifying new biomarkers, biomarkers that can be used to uh, in selection of patients for a clinical trial. Uh, and, and some of these biomarkers can also be used as companion biomarkers. So I'm not talking about those here. So my so I had to choose one. It's very difficult to lock them all. So I decided to choose this target here called uh, MNSOD mitochondrial. And to, to show its importance in cancer, I had to use some kind of uh, pool to manipulate its expression. I mean, I can use SIR. But we uh, recently identified MNSOD as a target for this nuclear receptor, PPR gamma. So in this study, I'll use uh, activators of PPR gamma to manipulate uh, or, you know, expression of MNSOD. Oh, moving on. Uh, if you look at breast cancer, my lab is primarily uh, focused on breast cancer. If you look at breast cancer, you know, it affects women worldwide. And this morning I was looking, I mean, there's no pink in India. 
I'm not sure why there's no pig in India. You know, maybe it's not prevalent in India. Hopefully I have to switch to some of the maybe. You know? But anyway, um, and you can see that in terms of estimated new cases, uh, breast cancer is on the top and in terms of uh, death, it's like standing at number two. Now in Singapore, similar to the rest of the world. Okay. So we have about 30% of the uh, breast cancer accounts for 30% of the women uh, affecting women. And we have about three, three deaths at room four. Mm -hmm. But the uh, frightening <coughs> thing is in, in Singapore, there's increased incidence in younger women. You can see the trend here. You know, these are the major ethnic groups in Singapore. So we have the Chinese, the Indians, and the Malays. And, and, and the rate of incidence is, uh, it, it <laughs> appears to be higher in the Chinese, but it's, it's progressively increasing. Now, uh, if you look at these three groups, right, if you take the three ethnic groups, uh, no breast cancer, same stage, same chemotherapy, what we found was the Malays do not respond well as compared to the Chinese and Indians. So it's a very interesting finding because we do not know why you know, there's some genetic uh, studies that we need to do. But I thought that was quite interesting. You know? Now, uh, in breast cancer, of, I mean, I'm sure everyone knows this, so I can go through this very quickly. Okay. So we have the luminal subtypes that are possibly for estrogen receptor, and we have the HER2 enriched type, and we also have the triple negative breast cancer. They are, you know, lack of all these three receptors. So, now the triple negative accounts for about 15 to 20 percent of the of the breast cancers. And our interest is mainly in this triple negative because they have poor prognosis in the clinic. Uh, over the years, a lot of work has been shown uh, using activators of PPI gamma in various cancer types, and it's shown to be uh, to have good anti-tumor activity in pancreatic cancer, in glioblastoma, in renal carcinoma, in colorectal cancer. And from our group in breast cancer, and in collaboration with Dr. Dalton Sethi, who will be speaking later today, uh, in gastric cancer. I'm blocking this side. Of it. I might walk around. I hope I don't shoot. Anyway, no, 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 it's okay. Now, PPI gamma. I mean, it belongs to this so people in the sector super family. And, you know, the three, the alpha, delta, and gamma. Uh, the gamma is, I perform is the one uh, most well studied. It can be activated by anti diabetic drugs such as the TCDs or dietary fatty acids or prostaglandin uh, derivatives. Now, PPA gamma has been linked to lipid metabolism, diabetes, inflammation, and cancer. Now, in cancer, it has been linked to its uh, connection to backstab or anti-proliferation or anti-proliferation or anti uh, uh, The natural ligand is this <laughs> prostaglandin derivative QDPTJ2 and the synthetic ligands are the TPTs that, uh, that used to be prescribed for diabetes. Uh, and in this <coughs> table, we can see that Cells treated with 15 GPG, the tumors do not grow. And we have shown uh, others and us, we have shown in breast cancer uh, that targeting PPF gamma uh, has good therapy for that disease. However, despite all this preclinical evidence, when you go to clinical trials, none of the PPF gamma uh, clinical trials have worked. Especially in breast cancer, you look, say, trochlidin, uh, trochlidin, which has been withdrawn from the market due to adverse effect, has little uh, uh, clinical value. Mm -hmm. And here, in the case of rosiglidin, which was also under a lot of data, uh, it's been shown to have adverse effect. 
and I think in November 2013, FDA lifted all restrictions on prosecutors. But it didn't work. So the reason could be several. You know, recruiting the correct type of patient for this clinical trial, or have some kind of a new selection market that would assist the conditions. Now, which patient would better respond to this drug? So, so those those details were not uh, uh, available during those early clinical trials. So now, switching a little bit, now switch to Ross. Um, we all know that we did have to have an intuitive balance of Ross and distribution. You know, if, if the balance uh, shift tilted to the right, the new results is uh, there. Uh, the entire oxygen system, you know, we have the SODs, the catalysts, the new dialysis, etc. Right. And, and Ross has been uh, used to kill uh, triple cells, been shown by many, many people. Uh, if you look at PPR gamma, <coughs> activation of PPR gamma leads to increase in intracellular ROS level. All these studies here have shown. However, none of the studies have shown uh, the exact mechanism. <coughs> Some mechanism has been suggested, but in none of these studies, you know, this has been uh, proved. Uh, in a mitochondria, MNSOD, cancer cells are heavily dependent on MNSOD and uh, to maintain their ROS balance. And MNSOD knockout mice, they die just after birth. Uh, in 2008, using mm -hmm. SIRNA knockdown of MNSOD has been shown to lead to uh, mitochondrial driven recovery processes. And in 2007, they identified the mouse MNSOD as a beta gamma target. So, so then I thought that the human MNSOD should also be a target. Yeah? So we then, uh, with the help of a PPR research engine developed by us in November, we identified three purely PPR uh, response, uh, PPR gamma response elements, so the promoter of the new MNSOD, uh, which we then did some promoter fashion experiments and I think uh, that the activity lies somewhere in this region that contains the PPR in 2 and 3. And then by DNA binding assay, we showed that the other 3 is the vulnerability uh, by itself. Now, uh, we were, uh, using available database uh, out there, then if you were to look at the different subtypes of breast cancer, and you see that uh, expression of MNSOD is highest in the triple negative. This is from uh, one cohort, and this is another cohort. And within this triple negative of, um, this uh, basal subgroup, uh, patients with high expression of MNSOD appears to have a uh, poor performance. The value is not significant, but there is a gap difference in the uh, Using a uh, Negative uh, cell lines, we show that silencing uh, and, uh, SIF RNA depletion of MNSOD leads to uh, mm -hmm. cells being sensitive to both docetaxel and doxorubicin. See clearly here, and also in long term quality as chronic assay. However, when you repeat the same experiments in the normal or so called normal breast cancer, uh, breast cell lines, such as MCF 10A or 1A.
Philip is basically the king of both, but most importantly, the city is basically expected to be a man of So we then ask, can we see this in the clinic? So we did a retrospective study, and we collected tissues of uh, diabetic women who developed breast cancer. And for their diabetic condition, they were prescribed prosecutors. So that's good for And then group two is uh, where for their diabetic conditions, it's not, they're not prescribed prosecutors, but other diabetic drugs. Then group three are uh, non diabetic breast cancer patients. Uh, we couldn't get a huge cohort, mostly. so you may not be six. six. However, the, the difference was very striking. Because in group one, in the tumor, you see a decrease in MNSOD, but not the adjacent normal. Compared to patients in group two or group three. Right? So we thought, okay, then you know, the we, are, we are going somewhere. So we then did combination study. And you can see the combined use of rosiglitazone or, or rosiglitazone or, or, or rosiglitazone and capsule has a more favorable uh, outcome compared to the use of the agents uh, as, in, uh, as single agents. However, we do not, again, we do not see this when we use the normal press that line. We show that these effects are indeed due to increasing MNSOD, so we have to do this overexpression experiment. You see the MP vector, the combined use of those C, ROC, or DOCS, ROC, and this effect is completely gone in cells that are overexpressing uh, MNSOD. We then moved on to develop drug resistant cell lines in our environment. So we developed uh, 231 cells that are resistant to DOCS, so we did have 231 cells that are to those and we saw that in this resistant cell access, higher MNSOD is in expression compared to the sensitive cells. And when you depict MNSOD in this resistant cell line, either by anti RNA or the use of uh, activators of the gamma, you can reverse the resistance, both in the case of Dr. or Lositan. Now, because MNSOD catalyzes the conversion of superoxide to hydrogen. We showed that when you silence MNSOD and measuring uh, by the control production of superoxide, uh, there's increased uh, superoxide production, which can be blocked by scavenger uh, ANC, and it can be blocked by overexpressing MNSOD, and it can also be blocked by the by blocking activation of the that that one is in the attack. Uh, cancer cells are normally under oxidation stress. So this terminology of fine oxidation therapy is you know, if you look at a normal cell, you know, their baseline cross levels are thick. The tumor cells are high. So let's say this is the gateway to death. So the idea was can we give them, you know, using a ROS, using a probe, can we you know, increase their baseline ROS to a level that fits them? And, and the normal cells would, you know, barely increase. So this whole idea is called oxidation therapy. Yeah. And, you know, it's because they learn ROS. Exercise learn ROS. So we thought, well, let's give them more ROS then. You know, we cook them with the old juice. And then see, now you like ROS. Okay. So that's the whole idea. But it's how to do this specifically in the tumor and not the, like the normal cell. So that was the dilemma. So, the, so that's how my, my story is developed. You know, how we can specifically target something in the tumor that will give them this more ROS. And the, the two traps that I've used, Dosi and Dopsi, been shown to be lost in using drugs by uh, several people. And, and in, even in our hands, we do see that. So then we went on to check the ROS levels in the combination therapy. And you can see that, you know, the ROSI plus ROSI or ROSI plus DOMS, there's a lot 
more increase in mitochondrial superoxide production compared to both stages uh, single. And this can be blocked by overexpressing MNSO2. But such an increase is not observed in a normal cell. So the whole uh, proposed regimen is, you know, you activate PPI and it will depress MNSOD. You will increase growth, so it will increase it a little bit, yeah. And then you come in with a, a ROS inducing drug such as DOSI or DOPS, and that should <laughs> that should kill it even higher, and, and that leads to death. And, and from our in vitro experiments, we don't see this happening in the normal cells. So it may be a good uh, thing to test in the clinic. However, now the other way is we can now uh, see if you know by working with uh, Chemists, we can develop drugs that will inhibit that, specifically inhibit the activity of MNSOD, but not the other SODs, because in the normal cells are more dependent on opposing SOD. That's why when you manipulate the MNSOD, you don't see any uh, cell killer. So that's one idea. Uh, coming to this PPR gamma drugs, you know, what are useful drugs that will not use in the clinic, even though Rossi is okay. <coughs> Even the clinicians, they do not want to do a phase one. Uh, so what do we do? You work with chemists and develop your own PPR And that's what Prof Professor Rangapa is doing. You know, that's the our technology. Coming up with new drugs. But it's going to take 15 years to see this drug in the market. No, I may retire, but I don't know. But, uh, but I want to do it now. So Daiichi Senyo has a new generation PPR gamma drug called CS7017 and this drug is extremely potent, more potent than the glutosols. Uh, they have done their phase one and this is their current trials and they just completed phase two and uh, to a series of discussion with them because uh, what I did not show is for this PPR gamma drugs, uh, we have identified a new biomarker that can be used for drug monitoring purposes. So then you can, uh, you know, after the first cycle, you can tell whether the patient is going to respond to the drug or not. So under NDA, I can disclose to them, but we have an agreement now, and so so my job is to further develop their drug for breast cancer because they're not doing breast cancer. And uh, so, so this, this is the type of collaboration that uh, we look for, and I think that's about it. I have to thank my group, uh, Miss Lu here, who will be turning in the PhD thesis, giving all the work uh, that I have presented. And in Singapore, the, the Ross experts are Shadid and Marie. Because I'm not the Ross expert, I'm more the different expert. Right? And of course, I need the help of clinicians and uh, all the money they can give me to run all my projects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for. May I run into one more question? Thank you for a very nice lecture. Thank you. I think we're doing really well. Thank you. I, I should say I have found one of two very good senior restaurants in Singapore. But anyway, it was a great talk. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh,
Yes, that's right. I request Dr. Sabir Vishwanath to present my mentors to the session chair as a token of our gratitude. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the second technical session. We now break for lunch. I request the delegates to wave their tags at the dining area to facilitate smooth service. Kindly we assemble for the next session post lunch at 2.30 p.m.